Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us for Ram Lakes Online, which is the first one we've ever done. So um, it's been an interesting evening so far with lots of events and lots of stuff going on on, on our social media. So if you haven't seen that, pop over and have a look. Um, just going to do a few housekeeping bits before I hand over to Michelle and Lara. Um, in a minute, we'll be playing the film and I've popped in the chat the YouTube link just in case for some reason it doesn't work. Um, playing it through Zoom, because sometimes it can be a bit glitchy, just click on that link and you can watch it directly on YouTube and then just come back. The one thing you just need to do is mute, make sure that you mute the sound on Zoom. So you just do that by clicking on your microphone and press clicking on leave computer audio. And that just makes sure that you're not having the two films running at the same time. Um, I'm going to hand over in a minute, but and then at the end, after the film, we'll come back and Michelle and Lara will be um, having a chat, but also happy to answer any questions that anybody has. So if you have any questions, pop if you can pop them into the chat, um, I'll keep an eye on that and then I'll um, relay, relay those questions for you um, when we get to that section of the event. Um, I think that's probably all I need to say housekeeping wise. So firstly, I'm going to introduce Michelle and Lara and hand it over to them. Hello, welcome. Hi. Um, so um, I'm Lara Goodband, I'm Contemporary Art Curator at RAM and um, I'm thrilled that I've had the chance to um, work with Michelle Williams Gamaker, who is, as I'm sure you will know, um, a moving image and performance artist um, or filmmaker. And um, I'm just trying to change my screen so I can actually see Michelle there. Yes, I can see Michelle. Um, and um, we're going to have um, a conversation about the new commission um, that Michelle has made for RAM, which um, is actually installed in RAM, but unfortunately we're closed at the moment because obviously we're in lockdown. Um, it is looking wonderful. But we're going to have a chance to look at it um, and watch it this evening. Um, Michelle has been shortlisted for the prestigious Jarman Award, and I'm just going to hand over to Michelle now, who will tell you a little bit more about her practice. Then we'll talk a little bit about the commissioning of the work, um, watch the film, and then we'll actually talk about the film, and um, we'll introduce you to Carrie, who um, is the narrator in the film as well. So over to you, Michelle. Oh, thanks, thanks, Lara, and thanks to everyone at RAM for hosting this event tonight. Um, and thanks all, all of you for being here. I can see lots of people that I wish to say hello to, but I'll just um, keep going. So um, yeah, about my practice, I am a filmmaker, really very much interested in performance. I used to perform myself, but um, I think I've, I've sort of, I'm shifting more towards directing and working with actors and, and individuals who aren't actors but want to perform and I suppose the RAM Commission was um, a new challenge for me which we'll go into in a bit more detail but in general the recent body of work that I've been making looks very much at the history of 20th century cinema the 30s and 40s particularly and looking at um, studio films um, from American and British cinema so um, very much looking at the special effects, looking at some of the decisions around casting and looking at restaging specific scenes from those films. So um, yeah, the film that's in the Jarman Award is um, part of the Dissolution Trilogy, which focuses on the marginalized characters from Black Narcissus, specifically the character of Kanchi, who was played by Deborah Carr, a white actress, um, and I recast um, that that role with um, individuals from a South Asian background. So um, that's kind of me in a nutshell, but basically um, working with the RAM collection posed new challenges to the practice and we can maybe discuss that um, as we go along. So um, I, I saw that work um, in the Arts Council collection um, exhibition at Birmingham. Um, I'd only just started um, in this role at the Royal Albert Memorial Museum, which is a, a new role funded by Arts Council England. Um, I think it was in December 2018, 
and um, it was beautifully pre presented and Michelle was there to talk about the work as well and I immediately thought this is just the kind of artist that we um, should be encouraging to come to Exeter, visit the museum and um, see if there's an opportunity to work with Michelle. So um, I think he came in February um, last year um, and I set up a series of meetings. We're very fortunate at RAM to have a number of um, specialist curators and assistant curators who work um, across the collections. Um, so do you want to say something a, li a little bit about that first Absolutely. meeting? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I need to sort of paraphrase all of this by saying um, the, I don't remember if it was, yeah, it must have been the first visit or if not, it was my second visit, but I, um, the process of making this film more or less coincided with um, my pregnancy of Wren. And so um, it, I want to say a bit more about that, but when we first met, um, I don't, I, I, I remember, feeling very spoilt because you gave me access to different curators from different parts of the collection. So uh, one of my, um, one of the greatest privileges as an artist is get, getting access behind the scenes of any space and in particular, the kind of bowels of a museum, if you like, the, the kind of storerooms of the museum really are wonderful places to explore. So there was, I seem to remember a wonderful collection of shells that Exeter has. And there was a moment where I thought, can I make a story about uh, the world's largest collector of shells? Quite possibly, but, um, and I remember looking at a section with Julian Parsons, I think connected to the history of Exeter, but it was actually, um, and there was this incredible old uh, witch's cauldron of the last known. Um, yeah, um, Elizabeth Webb. Yeah, it Webb's um, cauldron, and, and I was very moved by that object, but ultimately it was Tony Eccles' uh, collection in world cultures that um, drew me to it, and specifically the Arctic uh, vitrines. And now I guess that posed a, a genuine problem for me because a lot of my recent work has looked at um, South Asian history. Yeah. Um, um, and um, I didn't actually feel very equipped to um, tell the story. And, and at first I didn't have a story. I wanted to just make that clear. I just, I just liked the objects that I saw and thought that maybe I could make a story about them. Yes. So um, I suppose that was the thing about um, us inviting Michelle to the museum, that it was um, absolutely open and we had a theme of um, untold stories that we've been exploring this year or, or rather trying to explore because obviously we've been closed for a large part of the year and some of the theme and ideas are going to be carried on into next year. And um, it seemed to me that Michelle's way, um, both her way of working and her kind of fictional activism um, lent itself to exploring some stories that may not have been um, made very clear through objects and stories. And obviously we've, we've got so many objects, it's not possible for us to have researched all of them. But there are particularly um, sensitive areas around dealing with um, it, world cultures and ethnographic collections. And um, we started those discussions with Tony. Um, and you made many visits to the museums and, and you started to talk to people at the British Museum as well. Yeah, that's right. So um, maybe before we watch the film, I should yeah. just say a big hello to Carrie Ayakuduk Ajanan, who is here. And I'm basically um, without Carrie's support, I don't think I would have felt very comfortable handling the story of Ada Blackjack and Anupiat woman. Um, and I very much relied on Carrie's um, knowledge to help me um, ensure that I was being as sensitive as I could to, um, to, to Ada's story. So just maybe to, before we watch the film, um, and speak with Carrie afterwards. I think um, 
it's important to say, just to give you a context, I, li I liked the objects in the vitrine and then I did something very basic, which was to write into Google um, famous um, Inupiaq people. Like something is very, you know, just something is um, basic as that and uh, Wikipedia delivered um, several names in on, on a gen generic page of notable Inupiaq individuals and the story of Ada um, was a page in itself but it seemed to me that uh, from doing more research there was not very much information out there on her story so given that the theme of uh, the commission was an untold story it, it was enough detective work I went back to my B&B &B that night and I was already on the phone to um, a library in Alaska <laughs> and um, that was really amazing because they were so generous and told me that they had um, scans of Ada's diary and then I was connected to Rauner Special Collection in Dartmouth College and they sent me some other documents and that was basically the kind of um, bones of a story that needed to be put together so yeah so, should we watch the film now? Yeah, please stop me. Okay. <laughs> If anything happened to me, my death is known. There is a black strap for Bennett's school book bag for my only son. I wish. If you can please take everything to Bennett that belongs to me, I don't know how much I would be glad to get home to folks. April 6th. I chop wood and I feel better today. And I open a case of biscuits. Blowing today. I guess night is feeling worse. He didn't have tea this evening. He said he was headache. April 21st. Would I come in and build the fire? Night started to cruel with me. I can't count how many times he started to cruel with me and say something against me. He says, Black Jack was a good man and was right to treat me mean. He never stopped to think how hard it is for a woman to take four man's place, to woodwork and to hunt for something to eat for him. And he mentions my children, saying, no wonder your children die, you never take good care of them. He just tear me into peace when he mentions my children that I lost. This is the worstest life ever live in this world. If night happens to die, what will I do here in this island all alone? He is lying in bed since February 9th, and now April 21st, he looks very skinny. And it's a long time yet till we might see ship come. Well, God knows everything. May 4th. I dreamed last night that I was in a land where night and I was all alone and I left for Siberia with one dog and I was left all alone. And I saw some men with dog team and I run down to ask them if they were going to Chinook. They said they were hunting. 
May 7th. And I dreamed last night Bennett and I was looking at some pictures and we saw a picture of people swimming and Bennett said, swimming pool. And I asked him, who told you these are swimming pool pictures? And he told me, Albert told me. May 12th, I was at the traps today. Nothing at all. I fried biscuits for night. That's all he eats for nine days. He don't look like he's going to live very long. If I happen to live until ship comes, oh, thank a living true God. June 5th, I was over the island and got some sweet brutes. I shot one doodle bird. I thought, that's good enough for me for first time shooting with rifle. And I saw a polar bear. It was way out on the ice, first from south of camp. Knight said he was fainting last night. He is just dying. He could hardly talk. June 10th. This very important. Noted in case I happen to die. I don't want his father, Blackjack, to take him on account of stepmother, not for my boy. My sister Rita is just as good as his mother. I know she loved Bennett just as much as I do. If you please let this know to the judge. If I got any money coming from boss of this company, $1,200, give my mother, Mrs. Atotuk, $200. If it's only $600, give her $100. Rest of it for my son, Mrs. Ada B. Jack. I know my life is close. It's June 10th. I, I can't go out hunting today. My eye is sore from snow blinds and rain. Sky. Night is very sick. He hardly talks, and he is very strange. He nothing but his skin and so bones. My son, he lay in his sleeping bag for four months. So hard. June twenty second. I moved to the other tent today, and I washed my dishes and getting some wood. June twenty sixth. I was taking a walk over to Little Island and I found three seagull eggs in one nest and I cooked them for my lunch. I take tea and saccharin. I had a nice picnic all by myself, June 29th. I am home all day because I got my monthly. July 19th, I scraped one reindeer skin for my parking and I sewed the hook and made fancy wool trimming around the hood. July 21st. It is all finished today. It looked like a party, all right. I also made short boots of reindeer skin and slippers. I cleaned seal flippers and put them away in case a ship comes so I can take them home and eat them with my sisters. If the Lord let me have it, thank you. I start to salt the birds now. Oh yes, I forgot to hold up the canvas boat and it has been drift away. I made another canvas boat, better one this time. I'll finish it tomorrow, if God permit me. August 4th. I was just reading about Frederick A. Cook. It looks like the ice is out. I cannot see very far. It's very foggy all day. And today I found bear tracks east side of the tent. August 8th. Now I see the ocean is pretty clear, so it looks like I was going to see a boat. Sometimes I can see a mile or two. I thank Jesus that keep me from loneliness.
Oh, yes, I dreamed last night. I was singing three cheers for the red, white, and green. I dream of strange dreams. So August 12th, I found lard can was empty that was full of seal blubber. The polar bear has been eating last night. I thank the Lord Jesus, keep me from danger. The wind is from the west, first time for about a month, and I dreamed the night before that the boss asked me if I would have things credited from the store. I said it will be nothing, as I have been here for two years. A stunning, a haunting film, as I think you'll all agree. And um, I have um, a few questions um, about the film, and um, really leading on from our discussion before, Michelle, um, around um, some of the ob other objects that actually um, appear in in this film. So um, you chose some what are really quite tiny dolls and and um, little models um, from the collections that are on permanent display. And then you also went into the stores and in the dream sequence, and um, we have um, a real variety of objects. Do you want to say something about how that came about? Yeah, this was um, perhaps the one area of artistic license that I gave myself because I think, um, what was really important to the curator, Tony Eccles, as well as myself, was that I um, respectfully handled the objects um, in terms of trying to pair them with Ada's story. However, um, one experience I had in the stores, um, which really stayed with me, was um, 
and it actually stayed with me when I was um, talking with Julian as well was um, well maybe there were two experiences one was um, coming across um, a, a kind of blade um, a, it was a, a made of uh, the jaw of a bear and that was a part of the um, North American collection and it was um, part bear jaw and part steel and the steel came from Sheffield in the north of England and um, together with looking at Exeter's, um, the finds from Exeter's riverbed where there were pieces of Chinese pottery, what we, what we know of all the world and of colonized spaces is that they're not happening um, in just alone, they're happening in confluence or to, you know, they're happening together. And I wanted, um, I very much could empathize with this um, feeling of isolation that Ada talks about, but I wanted her to have some witnesses and those witnesses came through the collection. And I think that, you know, um, what features in the film are Mexican rain gods, um, some Thai dancers and um, some Indian street souvenirs. And I just wanted to make a nod to um, the multiple colonial histories that um, exist um, in those objects, essentially. And what was so poignant about Ada's diary was even though there were just a few sentences scattered throughout, she did mention her dreams. And the dreams for me um, gave me just that small amount of license to be able to bring them in sensitively um, and, and not more. They're not, they're not more than observers as yeah. far as, as I feel. Yeah. yeah, and I think it is um, very sensitively done. And also that's why um, we want to be able to invite artists in to work with the collections. Um, curators have a different kind of um, relationship and responsibility to the objects they work with. Um, and then there's um, other people who work with um, collections as well at the Museum Conservators. And um, I really, really love the bit where you have focused in on the Conservators' hand brushing the object, that real act of care. And um, I'm not sure whether it's even more poignant at the moment when we're living through this pandemic and we're caring for our loved ones and worrying about them. And we know that our health service is doing a fantastic job. Um, and I, I just wondered whether you really, I know you're incredibly organized. I mean, you have, you have to be as a filmmaker and I, I have to tell all the people on here just how amazing Michelle is and in terms of her organizational ability as well as her creativity. Um, but to have that um, understanding that you wanted to go into the conservation lab and you knew exactly what you wanted. And I know you had a lot more footage, but I wondered if you could say something about that. Yeah, so I suppose um, trying to kind of go back on the process, Ada's diary um, had this thread, the thread of basically survival and trying to um, do everything really to survive, to get back to Bennett, her son, who actually was in a home um, because he had tuberculosis and she needed money to um, be able to um, pay for his care, basically. So... Um, with that in mind, I felt a, a very strong need to um, care for the for the objects that I had uh, decided to to call Ada. And working with Sarah Klopf was great because she um, she knows how to handle these objects and and really to to remove the dust. It's like you, the tiniest. Um, Hoover, you know, like the tiniest yeah. little vacuum cleaner. And um, so for me, I suppose I had written uh, or storyboarded an idea that this figure of Ada would be placed in and out of spaces. And, you know, they are static objects. So just trying to bring in a small amount of movement, um, which um, we did through either the conservator's hands or Tony's hands, the curator, or through uh, using fans from my brilliant um, collaborator, Sophie Bramley, or Eddie Popperwell designing um, a turntable. These all en en enabled just a tiny bit of 
movement to um, static objects. And, and I have to say, because we haven't been able to appreciate it and, you know, depends what you've been watching get on as well, but we, we weren't able to appreciate that it, as it was beautifully made. I mean, the sound and visual effects are absolutely stunning. And, um, and it was also, it's also been fabulously presented by um, an AV technician, Oliver Sutherland in the museum um, with um, wonderful speakers and, and everything, it's, you know. <laughs> I really hope that um, when you have a moment, everyone, if you can watch it on the YouTube channel, it's certainly higher resolution, but also um, Sara Pinera, who's here actually, worked really hard to um, work sensitively with the need to in introduce Foley, but also to work with Aaron Couples' wonderful evocative soundtrack. So there are layers to this production that are, you know, um, yeah, very special to me, but I think it would be a wonderful moment to speak with Carrie. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, I thought I'd, I'd love to hear, Carrie, some of your um, thoughts about working on this project, if possible. Um, so yeah, it's very, really, really, very really nice working with Michelle. She's been oh, very, very sensitive to anything that um, I had concerns with regarding the script or or, um, and I, I thought the, um, the care of the objects um, were just, it was just very, very delicate. And, and um, yeah, I've, I've been. Yeah, I wanted to say it's Carrie's voice that you're hearing in this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry, and I should have yes. said that. It's uh, yeah. Carrie is a poet. And um, to be honest, again, a bit like my very uh, clumsy Google searching for people, I, I, I was very much looking for somebody who could voice the, this, um, Ada's voice. And after speaking to um, some museums, I think it was the Katarovic Center, I think they um, connected me to you. And then I, I heard some of your um, readings of poems um, from roughly for the North. And I just thought, oh, if I could only contact you and it, and it happened fortunately so um, um and C carrie um <laughs> I'd, I'd love it if you could um explain to everyone um about the the language and um how the um colonizers um you know got rid of the languages and left carrie with a kind of broken english oh yeah so um uh in the Nome region and also in a lot of uh, across Alaska and across the United States, a lot of children were taken from their parents or, or were orphans because of um, because of disease or um, so they were often raised by missionaries. Um, and it sounds like Ada's story was um, kind of typical of the time where she was raised by missionaries to um, to sew and to cook, but she didn't really have a very strong command of English. They didn't teach her very good English um, or very good writing, but mostly sounded like she was taught sewing and cleaning and, and things like that. Um, and, uh, um, and it sounds like she didn't have her, her native language. She's from um, the same area that I'm from. I'm a King Islander, but I grew up in Nome and the area she's from is Solomon, which is about a 20 minute drive away, 20, 30 minutes. And it's near the ocean. Um, and it's a really beautiful kind of windswept area next to a river. And um, so when she had to walk to Nome to try to get this job, I can just imagine what a what a long walk that must have been, um, yeah, yeah. In um, fact, in fact, she um, she wanted to turn back. Apparently, from from my reading, that she um, turned up. Stephenson was the um, explorer that wanted the men to go to uh, Wrangell Island, but essentially, he had told Ada that there would be many other. Um, people joining that expedition. But when she saw that it was just her, she really had her misgivings and 
wanted to turn back, but also felt slightly, yeah, she felt a kind of pang of needing to support these men because if she hadn't have gone, I think they would have perished much sooner, to yeah, be honest. Probably a lot sooner, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. Um, none of the men on the expedition had any experience really in the region um, and hunting became really, really problematic very quickly. So um, it was Ada's kind of ingenuity that made it happen. You know. God, that's me. Um, so we've only got about five minutes or so left and um, I know Stephanie's going to pull out some questions, but I just wanted to tell you some of the comments um, Michelle and Carrie, um, wow, so powerful, um, stunning, amazing, feel very emotional, lovely we film, lovely haunting, really wonderful. People have seen it in Ram as well, so we were only open for a week or so. Um, <laughs> um, and beautiful way of storytelling and incredible sound, such a lovely film. Oh, and there is a question. Shall I ask it, Stephanie? <laughs> yeah, like, fine, yeah. Okay. Um, how long did it take to create from commission to the finished film? Um, so I won't answer for you, Michelle, if you want to answer. But um, Did you hear that, Michelle? Oh, Michelle seems to have frozen. Mm -hmm. um, well, it did, it took... Um, so Michelle came in the February and then it was finished um, literally um, about, we installed it um, about 24th or so of October. Yeah, so um, really, really recently. Um, and Liz Wells asks, where is it installed in RAM? It's installed in uh, World Cultures. Um, really close to the objects, just um, the other side of where the parker is displayed. And my question is really to do with the dialogue between the film and the histories and objects within the story. So um, the diary isn't held by the museum. It is, um, as Michelle was explaining, um, she'd been in contact with the library in Alaska. Um, do you want to say anything about that, Carrie? You don't have to, I was just wondering <laughs> if you had any thoughts. No. Um, I, I know that when, I, when reading through this, through, through the script that you could feel like a great deal of dread at the beginning. And then I've seen like once night died, she kind of got a second wind of optimism and she started feeling a bit um, more like she might pull through this. I think just how terribly she was being treated by her, um, by night might have been dragging her down quite a bit towards the beginning, I think. Um, we're gonna try and get Michelle back because she's been kicked out of the call. Um, <laughs> so I'll continue she's just, answering she's some- She's coming back. She's just coming back in now. Oh, okay, great. Um, and um, some, and Matt um, says, explains that it, um, is beautifully presented. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, um, thank you, Laura, and Michelle, and Carrie, an exquisite, beautiful film from Janet and um, Catherine. Um, hello, Michelle. I'm really sorry, I don't know. It's out of my own. <laughs> what happened? I just, I was speak. I thought anyway. Well, we've had, um, we've carried on answering some questions and um, Carrie's been a great help as well. So, um, and there's lots more um, really lovely comments and congratulatory comments in the chat. Um, and Alison Jones says, made me consider uh, how under globalization, many women are doing similar domestic caring jobs for Western families and are having to leave their own children back in their countries. But, yeah, so right. Yeah, I, I I know it's um, actually just when I paraphrase everything by saying that I was pregnant during making the film, I think I had a, um, yeah, I just understood that it was heavy, you know, for Ada to be separated from her, her child and to lose children too, you know, it was, um, 
I think she was very um, poorly treated. The relationship that she had to Lorne Knight seemed um, very abusive, actually. And um, in fact, his family um, initially um, accused Ada of um, neglect and of not looking after, of negligence. And I think that um, ultimately she was vindicated and it, it was okay, but she was left with several haunting uh, scars for being on the island for two years and also for, um, yes, a kind of cruelty of treatment, really. I'm so, so pleased there was a typewriter that she could um, pour her thoughts into because there wasn't anybody to listen, I think, you know, and maybe the diary or the typewriter became um, a really important ear, you know, or, you know, to, to hear her because um, I don't think she was heard by the rest of the party. Um, there's a really interesting document that I got from um, one of the libraries, which is actually um, Ada's oldest, uh, sorry, youngest son, the son that she had after um, her time on Wrangell Island. His name is Billy Blackjack Jr. And he um, actually tried to make a, a film treatment. To, well, he made a film treatment and he even wrote to Mikhail Gorbachev in um, Russia, essentially really um, imploring that he'd be allowed to visit Wrangell Island, which is now Russian territory. And just because he wanted to understand his mother's journey, unfortunately, he never received a letter of reply from um, the Russian government. But um, very recently, um, Carrie told me about it and Lara. There is a film on YouTube called Ada Blackjack Rising, which coincidentally sort of comes out around the same time as we've launched our film, but it's a, it's a live action film and it's worth um, Googling Ada Blackjack Rising because it's, um, I, I just watched it, it's, it's really good. And um, so it's, yeah, it's one of those things. I just feel like there's um, a huge amount to say and I think the objects can do so much, but I, I feel quite privileged to have read her diary. Um, yes, um, I, I just had um, one, one final question because um, I, I think some people might be um, in, interested as to whether you'd worked with museums like this before. Um, yeah, I have worked with um, the Freud Museum in London um, with my collaborative partner, Mika Bell. So together we had kind of interspersed about 12 screens throughout the museum. Um, so it's been, that was in 2012. So it's been quite some years. I think, yeah, to maybe end that the challenge was, was that um, maybe um, sometimes I come with my own stories and this was a really good challenge for me because it wasn't mine and I had to work in reverse, if you like, to find a way to um, sympathetic, sympathetically handle a story, but also find something of my interests. And maybe the one thing I can say about this film, and, and it's a great credit to Sophie and to Sarah, who worked on sound, and Aaron, who did the uh, composition, um, is that Sophie Bramley put together incredible lighting effects in the gallery. And I, I had asked Sophie to work on um, trying to make the galleries look colder or look like the Arctic or that wonderful Aurora Borealis effect is all um, Sophie's hard work and several of us moving lights, <laughs> trying to create this shimmering of lights. And, um, you know, you could really go to town on that. And um, in a way, if we had more time and if I was less pregnant, I would have wanted, if we could have got past the conservator as well, I, <laughs> I wanted to have smoke, you know, billowing through the yeah. but, it, but yeah. there, was, there was a limit and I, and I respected that that was not an option. I, in fact, I was told it was not an option. So it's like, so. Yeah, yeah there's, um, that's it. You have to um, work within the limitations of, 
um, the, the museum as well, but also you brought so so much creativity and thoughtfulness. And um, the process was um, sheer delight. I mean, um, Michelle has um, obviously had to go, go through this pandemic as we all have, but you know, at the point of having um, a, a young baby and then trying to make the work and, and everything else. And it's um, just wonderful that um, we've been able to get to this point and it will be on display in the museum until the end of March. And um, I, I, I doubt very much, unfortunately, that we'll be able to speak to you in person before it ends there. Um, but do, do come in, come and see it and, and spend time with the objects. And um, I just want to thank Michelle again. Um, it's, it's been a, a, a really interesting um, process. And uh, thank you very much for all your comments, um, which are really lovely in the chat. Uh, everyone's saying thank you. So um, thanks so much. Maybe I just want to say maybe the fact that it got edited during a period of isolation was apt, you know, like it, in the end, it took a while to complete, um, but it helped, I think, with the final cut because um, the experience of Ada is ex exceptionally lonely, understandably. So it, it, it made sense to me in the end um, to know a little bit about that feeling. Yeah. Thank you everyone yeah. for coming. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Curry. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, Curry. Bye. Bye. Everyone. Bye.